Welcome to Hey, Great Shot. This is the Great Shot Podcast, a Cracked Rackets and Tennis Channel Podcast Network production. My name is Alex Gruskin. On tonight's show, we've got another live edition of The Deciding Point, our weekly breakdown of everything that happens across the Division I college tennis world. Of course, here on Wednesday nights, we break down the Division I men's action. Week 12 of the 2024 season now officially in the books. This was a week where things got spicy. And if you've listened or watched our deciding points of late, and let me just say once again how great it is to be back here live on YouTube for the show, to have the opportunity to interact with all of you in the college tennis universe is why we started this podcast. Of course, if any of you have any comments, questions, criticisms of our thoughts as we go, please feel encouraged to leave them in the chat. But if you've been following along with the college tennis world of late, it does feel like it has been a rather steady two, three-week stretch of times where, yeah, there have been a lot of really good matches, but I don't know if we've had any signature upsets of late. Well, Week 12 delivered us those signature upsets. We have so many different results to get into on today's show. Welcome to the 2024 season, Stanford, something we can finally say after their massive weekend. You've heard us beat the state of Oklahoma drum of late. Well, how about the Oklahoma Sooners? the past seven days they've put together in terms of results. We've got those headlines, so many more things to get into on today's podcast, and that's why I am so grateful to have the man by my side joining me here once again tonight to help break things down. Of course, he joins me each and every week on this podcast. He's a man you all know best as the forefather of the college tennis formula, uh, college tennis ranks formula, excuse me, predictions never far from the listed UTR, the lean, mean mission. Michigan Wolverine, and again, the man who spearheads our coverage of all things SEC tennis on ESPN+. Plus. It's the professor, Chris Halioris, joining me once again tonight. Chris, hey, great shot. Welcome back to the show. This was a great week of college tennis, was it not? Oh, uh, if, I mean, you know, it was an absolutely stellar week, and it feels like one of the best since we got conference play started. You know, I don't want to say it's been a, a down year by any means, but We've sort of lacked the the big, huge, wow, somebody's, not, you know, top team getting beat or big flip in a conference. It's been a lot of yeah, mediocre type upsets, but a lot of, you know, you know, the teams that should, your Virginia's winning in their conference, the Ohio State's winning in their conference, that all of that's been sort of by the books. And we finally got, you know, a little dose here in the past week of some big time, big time upsets that have serious top eight and top 16 implications. That's absolutely right. And to your point, it was funny. I was talking about this last night with our dear friend, John J. Parsons, who was hypothesizing that at some point should the rankings formula by the time we reach middle of April, should a January win be worth 90% of an April win? And it was just an interesting thought exercise for him to introduce. But to his point, like again, Ohio State cleaned up in their non-conference schedule, and they have built up a big enough resume that they're not really moving in the rankings moving forward. Similarly, TCU, with how good they were through the two, first two months of the season, even with some hiccups, they still weren't going to be moving anytime soon. The only team that's really significantly changed its positioning in this post-national indoor stretch is the Texas men, who beat Ohio State, who beat TCU, who, by the way, needed those wins to get back in the mix. Well, they got them, and they are back in the mix, back at the place where truthfully we expected them to be to start the season but yeah to your point I'm not saying we haven't had surprising results but we haven't had any paradigm shifting results uh up until week number 12 well again we got them in spades throughout the course of this weekend so many different places we can start but there's only one place for us to begin Chris Halliors it's a team that is much maligned on this show as we hold them to high standards. We have seen the talent this team has possessed over the course of the last five years. And yet, you know, again, when was the last time we saw Stanford not only reach an NCAA quarterfinal, but reach that NCAA quarterfinal and be in a position to perhaps win a national championship? It does feel like it's been quite some time. And certainly coming into this season to bring back Basvaretti, Basing, 
uh, uh, Banerjee as well, the, the three big Bs, as we like to call them, here on this show, to bring those three back, to bring in clearly the number one recruiting class, Kyle Kang, Nico Godzik, Hudson Rivera, all these different pieces. It felt like this should be the year that everything falls into place for this Stanford roster. Well, obviously, pretty unequivocally, that hasn't been the case. They lose at Michigan in the kickoff weekend, so we don't see them at the national indoors. I feel like we talked a couple of times now. We keep harping on this match, but if you watch them against San Diego, lose, uh, San Diego's really good, but the way they lost doubles and six first sets and never really had a chance in that road match, that's just not the sort of performance a top 16 team, let alone a top eight team, an inner circle national championship contender puts together at any point in a season. And so, as we alluded to on last week's show, this was a massive weekend for Stanford to not only consolidate, you know, uh, trying to make a top 16 push, but really to consolidate their NCAA tournament resume. It felt like they had to at least get a split taking on two top 25 teams in Arizona, Arizona State. Well, Chris Helioris, they don't just get a split of those results. They sweep both of those results. Stanford, 4-3 winners over Arizona. They also, of course, get a 4-love victory over Arizona State. Obviously, that Arizona match to come down to the number one singles position, Nishesh Basavaretti versus Colton Smith. Nishesh, 6-3 in the third. He clinches it. By the way, all top three singles positions come down to three sets. Wouldn't have it any other way in a battle like this. Stanford takes the doubles point. They find three singles victories. They win two of the bottom three, which you feel like they had to do in every match entering the season, given the talent, the depth they possess. But again, to get that 4-3 win over Arizona, to get obviously a doubles point and wins at what, three, uh, five, and six against Arizona State, it's a massive weekend. A massive weekend for the Cardinal. Your reaction as we welcome Stanford to the 2024 season. I mean, we could probably add more seasons if you wanted to. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's what we expected. You know, Some of us had put voted them as high as number five preseason behind, you know, what we'll call our big four at the top. Uh, and, and I think we all had them in the top 10. But yeah, it's we know they've got the talent. But just with the three guys coming back, you're already in that conversation. And then you add the, the freshman class they had coming in that you mentioned with, with Kang and Rivera and Godsick. I mean, yeah, there's just no doubt this is what they should have been doing all year. It is good to finally see them back in the mix. And, you know, I don't think there's any question if they can do what they did this week. And Arizona is unequivocally a top eight level team. So to go and at, we expect a battle like a 4-3, especially out of Arizona. They're never going to go down easy. But if you can be at that level, you're just showing that you can compete at that top eight level. We know they'll be there the rest of the way. Now it's just a question of, you know, did they somehow do too much damage to themselves early um, to make it matter too much? They're going to be dangerous if they don't host. And they're right there now on the bubble of trying to fight for a hosting spot. If they don't, there's nobody that wants to see them as the two seed in their region. But it's also going to make it potentially a very tough match, depending on where they go, to to get out of. So, it you know, that remains to be seen. But absolutely, boy, is, is it nice to actually see that team and the talent on that team back in the mix. And really, they ought to. I mean, if there's karma, somehow they'll find a way to get top 16 because they should be hosting. They that That's where they ought to be. And then, you know, let's see them get into the third round and have to go somewhere to a top eight and get a really interesting match. Well, first of all, they've jumped up to number 18 in the rankings as a result of this win. So yes, they are now in the thick of that NCAA top 16 conversation. They still have dates against UCLA, USC, Cal, and Utah in the regular season before Pac-12 tournament play. They probably need to make the final, maybe even win the darn thing. I'd probably make the final if they get another win over an Arizona State or UCLA type and finish the regular season undefeated. But again, talk about playing your way back into the race. And here's the most amazing part, Chris. You talked about damage they did to themselves early in the season. I don't think that's the case. It's just that they didn't help themselves at all to start the season. I just looked at this team's record in the build-up to today's show. They're 12-4. and four. 
Surface level, 12 and like 16 matches feels a little low for April 3rd, but that's because they didn't make the national indoor championships. They did have that Texas swing where they played Texas TCU. They lost both of those matches pretty soundly. Uh, but, like, Texas and TCU are two of the top four teams in the country. There's no shame in those losses. Now, the at Michigan one at kickoff weekend, not great. But it's a stark reminder that as good as they are on paper, even freshmen like Kyle Kang and, again, Hudson Rivera, all these players, Nico Godzik, are going to struggle. And Bazing wasn't healthy. Obviously, they didn't have Bosferetti. A bunch of different things you could say. But, like, you're going to struggle early in the season. That said, now that we're back outdoors, now that they've had time to get comfortable, like, this team hasn't lost a match since losing to San Diego. Chris, Arizona was the first team to get a point off Stanford since that San Diego loss. And again, that's your nadir. That's your low point for the season. It's never going to get worse than that for Stanford. But, like, this team is still really good on paper. And if they have the opportunity, again, you talk about if they're not a top 16 seed, ask Harvard how that worked last season. Ask Kentucky, who was a heartbeat away from getting knocked off by Stanford in that Sweet 16 matchup in Lexington as well. This Stanford team is obviously still immensely talented, and they get the win they need more than anything else. Again, 4-3, they beat Arizona. The four-love win over Arizona State is also really impressive. Like, do not sell that on the road a weekend Stanford had to have, and they get it. Does it put a dent in your mind about the Arizona Wildcats? This is really their first surprise loss, dare I say, of the season. No dent in my mind to me. Like, if anything, it's just a reminder of Stanford ceiling. Yeah, no, there's absolutely no dent. I mean, we knew Stanford could be that good, and it wasn't like they got beat up 4-1 or 4-0. I mean, it was it was tight like you would expect that match to be. So, no, I have no, no qualms. Again, I don't think, and I haven't all along, I still think the top four is the top four. I'm not putting anybody else in that tier right now. And Arizona is in that next tier. Yeah. They're still in that next tier. That doesn't knock them in, in any way, shape, or form out of that. And I don't think they were in that top tier to begin with. So they're right where they were. And and, and it's a match that I would expect to be a dogfight uh, and no matter what with Stanford. Yeah, very well said. I completely agree with you there. By the way, I don't think it's a bad loss for Arizona State. It always hurts to lose 4-0 at home. But, you know, again... It was, they were up 7 6, six five at 1. They are up 4-2 in the 3rd at 2. And, I mean, Gannat was down 5-2 in the 3rd to Kang. So you imagine he's Gannat going to win that one. But not a bad showing for Arizona State. Again, it was just a stark reminder that the Stanford team can play. And for the first time this season, they showed us what that ceiling might look like to beat that Arizona team on the road. Again, they had to have it. They get it. Stanford, welcome back to the conversation. Obviously, Stanford wasn't our only surprising sweep of a weekend out of state, Chris Hallior, as we move from the West Coast. Now up I am, to the- I am going to throw in real quick. Oh, Austin, please. Before, before we leave there, the, the one, uh, you know, granted, it's not going to change the outcome of a 4-0 match, but the one thing to note from that Arizona State match is no Bor Artnock as he was down sure. in Mexico playing somewhere else. So tough to lose, you know, arguably Murphy and he, and, and Bohr have been just the rock at the top two for them. And that's a big, a big thing. So I obviously, I didn't think they were going to win that match anyway, but that, that dealt a severe blow to making it that much closer. It makes the idea, well, right now Stanford's undefeated in conference play, so actually they're looking like they could be the number one overall seed in the conference tournament. And again, USC, UCLA, Utah, and I forget what the fourth matchup was for them remain, uh, Cal, Cal. Like, yeah. they'll be favored to win all of those matches. They could end up with the Pac-12 regular season title, and they could go into that Pac-12 tournament 16-4 and four overall, come out of that with a title, and now you're 20-4 and four overall. Talk about a team that would be I'm not going to make the 2022 Virginia comparison where it was like so bad at the national indoors and then everything flipped from there, but there are shades of it. There are shades of, there are shades of like freshman year Virginia for this group where it was like, oh, they, they had this really great run and then they lose round of 16 to a much more experienced USC team only to come back the next year and win the national championship. Anyways, God did Stanford need that weekend. You know who else needed a big weekend? The state of Michigan. Chris Hallioris, who goes 4-0 and overall on the weekend over the state of Illinois. Obviously, the most notable results. Well, 
Truth be told, Michigan's 4-0 win over Northwestern was not something I expected on Friday, and there were moments when I think the team split the first three, uh, split three first sets, or maybe it was 4-2 across the board. It was tightly contested before Michigan pulled away from there, and obviously they had Patorn back. That was a big deal for them, but let's start with the Michigan State side of things, a team that got their first victory over Illinois since 1997, a team that has been a team we have spent so much time discussing throughout the course of this 2023-2024 season, dating back to the fall when it was announced that Thanos was coming in, that Marita was coming in, Homan was coming in, Collard was coming in. They just had brought in too much talent to supplement what they already had to not be immensely intriguing, obviously, early in the tenure of Harry Jaden, who uh, is someone we know well and someone I interviewed this week on the Cracked Interviews podcast to break down this Illinois win. This is a team we had circled throughout the course of this 2024 season, a team we were waiting to have a result like this. And look, they've come close a couple of times, right? Like I think the team was 16-3 and overall coming into the weekend. What are the losses? They lost to Princeton in the Blue-Gray final. They lost to, I want to say, Arizona in the Diablo final. And then the loss to Cornell as well, like especially with Cornell's win over Columbia, which we'll get to in a little bit. None of those losses are particularly disqualifying, but... They were still looking for a first top 20 win or a moment like this. You go on the road at maybe the best environment in college tennis, the Atkins Tennis Center, where you know you are going to hear it from start to finish, and you get a 4-3 win in a match that you lost three first sets in, plus doubles, in a match that came down to the number one singles court, Carlos Ozalans versus Ozan Barris. And again, to see Ozan come through in that moment, it is the definition of signature win. It is a definition of welcome to the party, Michigan State. And look again, the Michigan over Illinois win the next day on Sunday. Illinois didn't have Ozalans. They didn't have a Conquo. They didn't have freshman Jeremy Zhang in the lineup. That was a shorthanded Illini team. So I think that is a different brand of conversation. The Illini were full strength on Saturday against Michigan State, and Michigan State went out there, th- doubles point and three first sets down, 3-0 down overall on the scoreboard. They get a 4-3 win, Chris. They win at 5-6 and six against that Illinois team as well on the road. Like, that is what the best teams do. And they went out and did the damn thing, and then their best player, their signature guy, the guy of Michigan State tennis, the guy from East Lansing, the guy who went to this program to try and accomplish in a moment exactly like this. Like, you just got to tip the cap to him, don't you, Chris Helioris? This is a signature moment for a Michigan State program that is the definition of on the rise. Yeah, I mean, look, they they were looking out of this this weekend and looking forward to the Big Ten tournament at what they needed to do, what their focus was, what do we need to do to host those first two rounds of the NCAA tournament? And they knew that at a minimum, they needed to, assuming they play Illinois twice, which now doesn't look like a certainty. Now it might be Michigan in the semis, right? But assuming that they were going to get them twice, they needed to, at a minimum, split. And, uh, you know, thinking that, the road one might be tough. You had to go, okay, maybe that's going to be tough. We're going to have to come back and win the one uh, in the in the semis of the big of the big ten tourney. But boy, oh boy, if if this is what they could do, and now it's it is it's good to see now. I think Thanos being there and being healthy now for them has really added that extra. They were, you know, you you at the top, you went, you got Ozan, you got Ronnie, and then you had a whole host of guys that were all kind of in that that level but they needed another one up top and Thanos has really helped out there I think yeah it was a huge weekend for them put them right in that 16 spot really and now it's a matter of defend it and and now it's going to come down to in all likelihood it's going to come down to what happens in the Big Ten tourney and they're probably going to have a fairly decent idea when they get to that semifinal match of whether they need to win it to host or whether they're, you know, whether they might be able to squeak by without doing so. No, the only, again, Michigan State beat, like, 
probably low key devastated to see Michigan beat Illinois because had they got oh, the opportunity, not, not yeah. low key. Yeah, yeah obviously, not even it's just again to have had an opportunity yeah. against a top sixteen Illinois team for a second time. That would have been a really big opportunity to go out and play for your spot to host those first two rounds. Absolutely, but again, it's a sign of this team that has never done this. Like this team, this group has never been eighteen and three before. They've never been chasing top sixteen. It's all first time. Uh, experience for them to go get a win 5-2 the next day in Evanston at Northwestern not unimpressive is it Northwestern's best team no but not an unimpressive victory for a match that could get really tricky I mean again ask Illinois who loses 4-2 to a Michigan team that is just the most fascinating again they have taken they said hey 2023 Florida we would like your baton we're going to take it, and we're going to have the most fascinating 500 season in college tennis history. Because, again, what a 10-10 it is. Like, it speaks to the fact that Michigan came out, by the way, they got wins at 5-6. and six. Albeit, again, no Ozalans, no Oconquo, no Jeremy Zhang, but they got wins in 5-6. and six. They got doubles this weekend, like, after doubles has been just an outright disaster for the Wolverines this year. And again, did I expect to see Mert in the lineup at doubles this year? I did not, but it's working. Like they found some sort of sauce moving forward. And it was just a massive victory for a Michigan team that look is still flirting with the 500 rule. And I might've done some projecting just because it's our job to do that projecting, whether it's Michigan or any other school, but let's just say I might've spent some of my spare time this past week looking at the projections, Chris, and (coughs) excuse me. Um, like had Michigan lost that match to Illinois, they had Ohio State and Michigan State plus two other conference matches left on the schedule. They'd have been nine and eleven instead of ten and ten. Let's say they split those two. They're eleven and would uh, eleven and thirteen going into the tournament. Now all of a sudden, like you have to win your quarterfinal, have to win your semifinal to stay over five hundred to make the NCAA tournament. And now things just get a little bit easier. They're ten and ten overall. If they go two and two down the season's home stretch, they just have to go one and one at the NC uh, at the Big Ten tournament to avoid violating the five hundred rule. Anyways, again, it's the sort of little thing like a perfect game. You don't even want to speak out loud because you don't want to ruin its poten- or you don't want its chances of whatever being spoken into existence. But now they don't have to worry about that. And, like, for Gavin Young to get a win on the road, three sets over a fellow Minnesotan in Hunter Heck, that's the match it feels like Gavin's been on the wrong end of a bunch of different times of late. And he kind of needed that one to bounce his way. The Wolverines just needed that one more broadly. It's a massive win for Michigan, who I think is back up to 36 now in the rankings accordingly. It's just like... Congrats. You can breathe a little easier. If you take care of business, you will be in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I mean, a huge, huge weekend for them. You know, as you said, basically a a season, a season saver, because that was going to be very difficult, not just from the the bubble of the rankings perspective, but yeah, fighting that 500 mark and and the guys just needed it. They need they needed to go out. They looked at this point, they know. They're not seeing Nino, uh, you know, anymore. They got to figure out a way to do this. And whoever's playing in those spots, whether it's, you know, whether it's Mert, whether it's Cairo, whether it's, you know, Steiglin or, you know, those guys are going to have to step up and do it. And the, and the guys at the top really have, Bick's been great all year. Like he's been stepping up, but, you know, Honshiko went down uh, with that injury out West and, uh, you know, that made it even more difficult. Finally, they get him back, but it's, uh, yeah. And like you mentioned, doubles hasn't been great. That was a good, but. And Cooksey, just- Cooksey got two wins this weekend. Cooksey has yeah. been not national indoor 2023 Cooksey this year, to yeah. say the least. Not 2023 and, Cooksey, period. Yeah, and he looked like it this weekend. He was like really good in bouncing back. And again, to take that third set over Horve, that was kind of the the knockout punch, dare I say, for the Wolverines and knocking out the Illini on Sunday. Yeah, I think, and, and to your point earlier, it was sort of a triple, a triple-headed downer, if you will, for Michigan State for them to win. Because look, one- yeah, you're just in-state rivals and you don't like each other. Okay, whether you want to admit it or not. So th- there's that. But then two, uh, you know, from a rank from a rankings and an NCAA tournament perspective, knocking Illinois off, Michigan knocking Illinois off, knocks them down and sort of cheapen, you know, hurts the, the Michigan State points a little bit, which they're right at that 16 spot fighting for it. 
And then on top of it, they actually might have potentially robbed Michigan State now of the potential for playing them in the semis in the Big Ten, which that would be huge because now if it's those two playing instead, say, of Michigan State and Illinois, now they've taken away the opportunity to get more points because Illinois is going to be ranked higher than Michigan, uh, you know, come that point in time going into the tournament. So it will be less points on the line that Michigan State needs to host. So that was kind of a bummer for them, but... Still, I mean, Michigan State's right in the thick of it. No, now Harry calls Sean and says, hey, we have to do that same thing, but in Columbus this weekend. And it's like, huh, no. Or next weekend, whatever. It's like, well, that's probably not going to happen. Um, but, yeah, it's just like that's – you're right. Like it, the, the whole – a paradigm shifting, as I said to start the show. This was definitely a little bit of a shift. And again, state of Michigan four, state of Illinois zero this weekend. Shout out to the Spartans, the Wolverines. Uh, makes that regular season finale between the two in Ann Arbor that much more intriguing as well. Something certainly we will keep on our radar. But Chris, we've talked about some really fun things that happened in week number 12. We probably buried the lead. And look, had Oklahoma and Texas A&M played on Sunday or or Monday instead of Tuesday when the outline was already turned into West off, Oklahoma probably would have been our lead story. This is a team all season long, Chris, all season long. I have been beating the, I'm telling you, the Sooners are really good drum. And all it takes is just a look at their singles lineup. Fifth year Mark Mandelik, he's at the sixth spot. Like that guy has real weapons, real power. I think he's lost two matches total this year at six. When you have that sort of depth, him at Besides six. Besides the one and two beating Casper just well, gave him? Well, it's, look, <laughs> there are moments, right? This speaks to even when he has an off day, though, the fact that um, you look at the number one spot and. Yeah, yeah Mark. In yeah, Martinez. just Martinez, the way he gets yeah. the clinch over JPJ in what was their 4-3 win over a very short-handed TCU, but still a 4-3 win over TCU this past weekend. To go on, on the road and beat UCF, a team that had lost just twice entering the weekend. By the way, we're going to talk UCF in a second because talk about a team that has flown under the radar in terms of success this year on this show. But, you know, Oklahoma, 4-3 over TCU, 4-0 on the road at UCF. 4-1 over AM yesterday. Again, Martinez, Colomancy, who, if he's not still undefeated, because I think he lost to Vivez, but fewer than three losses in his freshman season. He's playing in the top 28, uh, top 28, excuse me. He's playing in the top three of his lineup. Hassan, Alvarez. Like, I like every piece. I like all the options in this lineup, Chris Halioris. Now you look at this team with their run, and I don't think their AM win is included, but they're up to number 11 in the rankings. And again, you look at yeah, just, it's, it's yeah, it wasn't in this week's, but live they're nine. That's and in crazy. literally, literally a dead, dead heat with, uh, I believe when I looked with Arizona, yeah, they're, they're like two tenths of a point behind Arizona for the eight spot right now. That's nuts. They're 17 and two overall. And again, what are those two losses? They have a loss uh, to Tennessee in Knoxville indoors on kickoff weekend. They lost five two in uh, Tallahassee to Florida State early in the season as well. Obviously, there was no Gorsney, no Fernley for TCU. And that TCU side of the equation, how healthy will they be come May? That's a legitimate question now. But that doesn't lessen the fact that Oklahoma still had to go out and win this damn thing. That doesn't lessen the fact that JPJ forced a third set against Martinez, and it came down to the wire, and he had to go out and clinch that match with all eyes on him. And look, senior at home, you got to win those matches if you want to be top eight. Oklahoma went out, and they found four points against this TCU team. I don't care if they were shorthanded. TCU won doubles, Chris, in this match. Like... That is an impressive victory for me for this team. This team is undefeated. By the way, TCU's got two losses in Big 12 play now. That Oklahoma-Texas matchup, that's probably for the regular season conference title, folks, in the Big 12. Oklahoma has played its way into top eight form, Chris, and like that's legitimate now because the rankings formula is not going to be like, oh, but it didn't have Fernley and Gorsney. Like This team's yeah. just in the mix now. Yeah, I, no, they're absolutely in the mix. And when you look at it, so I, I look at what Oklahoma has now done this year, and I make they are very akin to a team that I know very, very well, and that is Kentucky. 
they have very similar wins, and they both have a Kentucky beats Virginia number show. two. Ooh, I they like beat that. A Virgi- they beat a Virginia team that's shorthanded with for their best win. Oklahoma beats a TCU team shorthanded for their best win. So they're you know they Can both I beat A&M. the A and M. Oh yeah 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 okay. They Can both I... beat A and M. True. Yeah. And then you look, and what's what's really separating the fact that Kentucky's still, say, sitting up at you know projected this week or in the live rankings at five, and and uh, or, or Oklahoma down at nine, it's that fourth win. They both, it's like a twelve win for Kentucky, a thirteen for for Oklahoma. It's the next one where Kentucky's got a number fourteen, and Oklahoma drops down to UCF at twenty four. They just get a little bit weaker after that because they don't have that SEC plethora of teams to beat but the the wins are very 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 similar between the two and everybody's going to look at them pending and this it's a big pending but pending what happens with the remaining piece of the conference season and the tournament right we don't know if Oklahoma is going to be able to pull off another win over a Texas or a TCU in the in the season or the tournament we don't know if Kentucky's going to come out you know and and beat say their Tennessee's and A&M's in the tournament but Pending all of that happening, coming into the tournament, I'm going to kind of, I know I'll be looking at the at both of them the same as like, yeah, they've got that one big, big win, but the team was shorthanded and it's the same on both sides. But there is no question that Oklahoma has gotten very, very hot lately. And I tuned in to that A&M match last night and they looked phenomenal. I'll tell you what, Martin, and because I've raved about how good Rafael Perot has been this year for A&M. Martinez looked absolutely stellar last night. I watched a good portion of that match and he just was not, I mean, he was giving Perot no space and those two were hitting the heck out of the ball. Like you'd want to see it a one singles match. They, they were knocking the cover off the ball and it was just great, great tennis. Martinez 14 and two overall this year at the one spot. He's won his last 10 decisions. Monsi's 12 and one, uh, Mandelik 12 and four, uh, Alvarez 11 and 3 and the team's 33 and 16 in individual double sets. That's how you get to 17 and 2 overall folks. Like again, they have points they can turn to in every match and yet they still have some fluidity of options. Nate Hans only 3 and 0 this year. Like that's another piece that if he's healthy playing his best tennis and he's playing in the bottom half of their lineup like that team is so solid across the board in their six singles positions. The Kentucky comp is a very good one, Chris, and again, A&M TCU, UCF, San Diego, those are four really good wins to have on your resume with Texas and the Big 12 tournament still on the horizon as well, a date with Oklahoma State. That's another top 35 team. I'm excited to see what these Sooners do moving forward because now everyone's going to be ready for them. You know, again, they're no longer this quiet, plucky story we can keep turning to every week. It doesn't have to be a state of Oklahoma update. It's a, oh no, here's your look at the top 16 race, which Oklahoma is now firmly ensconced in. Again, a fantastic 3-0 and weekend. Wins over TCU, UCF, A&M. Let's talk about the TCU thing real quick here because you look for the Horned Frogs, Chris, there's some serious injury concern. Like, Gorsney has now been out a couple of weeks. Fernley was serving underhand when we last saw him. He didn't play this past weekend. Now, ultimately, TCU did bounce back. They got a big win over Oklahoma State that, I say big win, just a needed win for this group down a couple of guys to say, hey, no, we're still in the top 16 mix, even in this form. But, man, if they're not healthy, like, again, given how thin the margins are this year, and especially to lose those two in particular, Gorsny, who's won doubles with Vivez, along with an anchor in the bottom of their lineup, Fernley, who is, again, firmly in the guy conversation. What's your concern level for TCU right now? Very high. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a team that we talked about coming to the year. Tremendous talent, but they're a six-man team. Mm-hmm. And take anyone out of that lineup. And sure, on any given day, you know, you can win, you, you could forfeit the sixth spot and, and still, and, you know, as long as you still play three doubles matches probably and, and still win a match, no problem. Can you go all the way through an NCAA tournament like that and beat the the best teams at the final site and have to win three times? No, it's not going to happen. So they need a full healthy lineup. They can't afford to be even a man down. If it's a Fernley down or if it's a Gorsney down, it just doesn't spell 
good things for them, even assuming they get, even if we say, yeah, no problem, they make the final site, you have to win three matches against three, against three other top eight teams. And if you don't have your full roster with what they have and they have to move your set, your check up to five and play, say, Duncan Chan at six, it's, yeah, it's not going to bode well for them. So I am legitimately concerned. I'm actually, they're going to be a top eight regardless. So I was actually, even though it, you know, it obviously hurt the chances to win against Oklahoma. I was encouraged by the fact that they just, you know, hopefully it was just a, Hey, we're not going to play an underhanded serving Fernley. We're just going to let Fernley have some time off, get healthy. We're going to be in the top eight, whether we're two or whether we're five, whatever. There's no advantage really other than draw matchups because there's no home team at the final site. So, so get them healthy. Just make sure that you've got a good team coming into the tournament and what happens now, what whatever. But I am concerned. I love that they won both doubles points. It's something to build off of. I also love that all the guys who lost against Oklahoma, JPJ, Chan, Alonzo, Yurashek, they all won their matches against Oklahoma State or were in a winning position at the time things wrapped up. They have some, again, Alonzo and Chan are not Fernley and Gorsney. If that's who they're playing in the NCAA tournament, of course it's a different conversation. Again, let's just hope they get healthy because college tennis is a better place when this TCU team is fully firing, as we saw at the National Indoors when they reached the finals and were up 3-2 overall with two third sets on the board. So we know this team is national championship winning good. Hopefully they can get healthy to prove it. Still, it's Oklahoma, biggest winners of the week, wins over A&M, UCF, and TCU to make their top 16 push up to number 11 in the current rankings, nine in Chris's projections once you add in that A&M win. Chris Hellioris, let's move on now to five results I think people need to know from the past weekend because, look, we could break down everything, but I think these are the most significant upsets that as we look back at week number 12, these are the ones certainly uh, that you're going to want to know about. Let's start uh, with Cornell over Columbia 6-1. I, by the way, went back and looked at the Columbia resume. It's still really freaking impressive. But, man, for Cornell to win this match at home in this sort of fashion and just, again, kind of find success everywhere, what was your reaction to this one? I mean, I wasn't going to be surprised if it was a match, but I'm shocked at the result. I mean, the, the and, and the convincing fashion in which they did it. Look, I... I'm not going to lie. I'm with a lot of other people thinking I don't necessarily think Columbia is a top five type team, even though I've ranked them as high as that during the year, just because they were looking great and they were, you know, they were winning. But I think talent wise on paper, yeah, there are a lot of teams that are going to stack up better. Columbia is still a really good team. And we've talked about all year how the potential for Cornell has been there. We saw a little bit of that when they went and upset Michigan State. Now we get a really good glimpse in a 6-1 win over Columbia. I mean, that that team's got some some real dangerous parts to them. Still totally shocked at the result. I mean, I'm not going to I can't sugarcoat it. I, I just that was that was very hard to imagine coming 6-1 over Columbia. Tremendous win for the Big Red. Popaway and Sinhat 1 and 2, who are both top 75 players, that's as good of a 1 2 as any team, uh, as any pairing we've had in the country so far this year. Popaway beat Zhang 4 and 0. Oh. Sinha 4 and 4 over Kotsin. This team found what? Those two, and then they got three three set victories. Teodorovic uh, over Nick Kotsin, Paliska over Westfall, Pinzone over Ruger at the number six spot. Like, again. They after uh, they took the doubles point as well, excuse me, in this match. Like, you take doubles, you found two straight set victories, you're at home, you are in a winning position. And the fact that they only lost one match in straight sets as well, it kind of speaks to they were right there with Columbia everywhere, if not better, at all of these positions. And, man, like, it's just, it's brutal for the Ivy League, who might now be out of top eight contention. Columbia's fallen to 10, Harvard right now at 12. I will say Cornell is currently up to what? Cornell is currently sitting 28. at 28, Princeton's at 30. It's a deep Ivy League, there's no doubt about it, but 
I mean, again, it's funny. Looking at the Columbia resume, like, I still really uh, – what? So they've lost now to Cornell, they've lost to Harvard, and they've lost to Wake Forest. Wins over NC State, Tennessee, Alabama, Duke, UCLA, Pepperdine, outdoors, and when they hadn't played much outdoor tennis. Like, this is still a very good team. I guess the gravitas you'd have put behind the Tennessee win has declined a bit. The weight of the NC State win, I think, is has only aged – better and better still would you say this team has an inner circle win a top eight or top six signature victory maybe not so much like Arizona a loss like this just kind of confirms no they're more tier two than tier one like I wouldn't remove them from tier two but I'd still put them closer to that tier two conversation yeah I think you got to leave them in that group but boy I, I struggle uh having some reservations coming in and then this happening, you kind of go, I think they got to be at the tail end of that tier, but they're still a very, very dangerous team. I think the problem I have is I think they are far, far, far more dangerous at home than they are anywhere else. And you get them on a neutral site. And I think it's a, a potentially different story. And then outdoors for the NCAA tournament. Uh, and I think it, it'll be different. How about this Cornell team losses to Louisville, Penn, Yale, oh. Uh, excuse me, Louisville, Penn, Oklahoma, and SMU, but wins over Michigan State, VCU, Columbia, Middle Tennessee. Like, it's a very interesting Cornell team. Like, that is a frisky, dangerous team that, yes, I think they end up in round number two, but why couldn't they knock off a host seat on the right day, especially with, again, Papaway, Sinha. They feel like they can go up 2-0 on anyone. Yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, like I said, it's a very, it's a very dangerous team. I feel like they are, you know, they're a, they're a, a, a junior version of Arizona state, sure. like Arizona state. Interesting. I go, you got Cassone and Bohr and they really have McKinnon's been actually very, very good for them. So a little bit better, but it's one of those teams that you just look at and you go, yeah, nobody's throwing tons of respect at the bottom of the lineup. At the same time, everybody's going, yeah, but man, they could beat us in doubles, one, two, and all of a sudden we're down three points. Yeah. Like, I mean, anything can happen if that happens. And that's what you're saying when you face either one of these teams. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next result you need to know about. Arkansas beats Auburn 4-3. I, they wouldn't be Auburning if they didn't give us something like this. This is just what they do best. What do you see in that one, Chris Halliors? Obviously, you're our SECs are. Yeah, a complete fold from Auburn. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't get to talk to Coach Hushiar about these things anymore because now he's the women's coach at Mississippi State. But, uh, but yeah, I would love to get the uh, that recap from the inside, like I used to get from him. I covered this match. Auburn took five first sets. They did. They dropped the doubles point, but they took five first sets, and they looked to have this thing done. And somehow just let it all get away. And we've talked about this, it seems like, for three or four years running now. Yet maybe it's not the Tennessee or the Kentucky win that they usually pull off. But Arkansas at home always comes up with a win over, uh, you know, a a top t a top end team. And this was going to be their one for this year. It looks like they, you know, they played they played some other tight ones. But yeah, they're very, very dangerous at those home courts, especially outdoors more than in just because of the, the layout and the wind conditions there. It's a very hard place to play. Arkansas looked great. Look, I love I absolutely love watching Cajun at six for Arkansas. That guy, you know, I'm a sucker for, you know, just a good lefty anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, there is just no quit in that guy. And, and I love, I love watching him, but they, they did a tremendous job of getting in a deep, deep hole after taking the doubles point and nobody giving up. And they were down, you know, double breaks and breaks in the thirds on, at places and they got it all back. Uh, Moreno looked like he was going to clinch it for Auburn, even after everything turned. And, uh, and you know, Arkansas came right back and took it from them. It was very impressive from the Razorbacks. There are currently 11 teams from the SEC in NCAA tournament ranking range right now. Arkansas, the last of them who, after this win, they go all the way up to number 41. 11, Chris, men's team in NCAA tournament range. I'm not going to read them all, but... 
It's just about anyone. In- Easier to say Vanderbilt and Ole Miss are the two that Yeah, are. and by the way, Vanderbilt's at 48 right now. Ole Miss is at 59. So it's not like they're exactly out of the conversation right now either. That cut line, what, right now around 44-ish, if you had to guess, Chris? Yeah, because there's a couple teams in there that it's usually right around 42, but there's a couple teams that have 500 issues that yeah. are going to be questionable. So, so we'll see. The one note that I know we didn't have planned to talk about, so I will throw it in Please. there. Please. On that front is you mentioned Vanderbilt at 48. They need just something to help get them over the hump. Very unfortunate for them this week. Their match last night, due to the tornadoes and weather and everything else that ripped through the Midwest, canceled with Middle Tennessee. And from what I understand, Vanderbilt, due to scheduling, unable to even reschedule. Ugh. That's a match that they could desperately use to get themselves in the NCAA tournament. And if without rescheduling that and using that as a boost for them, they're going to have to come up with a big win in the SEC now. Yeah, absolutely. Again, 4-3 win for Arkansas. They knock off Auburn. They are now into NCAA tournament range, 11 of 13 SEC teams right now within that ranking cutoff. 41 is number Arkansas, last of them. How about UCF? 16-3 and three right now are the Golden Knights under first-year head coach Lloyd Bruce Burgess. And, like, come on now. That's ridiculous. And I know they lost their matchup to Oklahoma for love, but they beat Oklahoma State 4-3. What was a really fun Thursday match late into the night. Uh, I forget. I apologize. I'm blanking on the UCF player's name, but knocks Cron- off. Cronier. Yeah, beat Cronier Bacroft beats Bacroft deep in the third. And, again, that was a 7-6, 6-7, 7-5 matchup. I believe overall, like that's what it comes down to, to see Zink and Garcia rally the way they did, but then UCF kind of make this late push as well in single second sets. It was a really, really fun match. And again, you look for these nights right now, wins over Oklahoma State, Baylor, Tulsa, Penn, Miami. Like again, is there a signature victory? No, I don't think I would call this team a top 16 team right now, but guess what? The rankings don't have them in the top 16. The rankings have them at 24 and at 18 and three, hard to argue with that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's about where you'd expect. They have two top 30 wins, right, in yeah. teams that are in the 20s. And then everything after that go, you know, goes from in the 40s and down. But that's sort of, if that's where you, if that's where you want to be. And I think that is legitimately a 20, 20s type team, 20-ish, give or take a few spots, is where that team ought to be. You ought to be beating those teams that are, you know, down there and probably splitting with the teams in your range. And look, they split two matches with, you know, uh, with, with Florida and Oklahoma where they lost and then Baylor and Oklahoma State who they beat that are in that range. Now, they're going to get a big help from Oklahoma making the big jump next week in the in the rankings, but yeah, it's a th- that's sort of where you expect them to be, but a fantastic year. I still think even above expectations for them for, you know, for first year coach uh, you know, Burgess there. Yeah, no, again, and I think most of the teams like sophomores, freshmen, I think they have one, maybe two seniors like that's just a group to watch. A brutal loss. Sure how, I don't know what year Cronje is. He came over from VCU. I think, I think he's right? the senior that I'm thinking of. Uh, yeah, but again, the rest of the group, they're going to be around for a while. It's a huge win. Tough blow for Oklahoma State. Probably means they're not going to finish top 16. But again, that was a really fun match and it speaks to how good the Knights are already this year. How about Middle Tennessee? This is right up your alley, Chris. 4-3 over Memphis. I feel like that was significant. Yeah, I mean, it, it was significant in that they were probably you know they've still got a couple decent matches left but they were in that sort of how close are we going to get to the bubble and they don't have the big the you know conference realignment for them this year you got to keep in mind so they used to have that what uh, AAC or whatever they had UCF and and Tulsa and Tulane and all those folks to play well now it's like a five team conference USA or something so it's them and Liberty uh I mean it's there's not going to be a big chance there so there's and then the cancellation of the Vandy match they were they were on the border they've got like I think Tulane and UNC Asheville if I remember looking right uh left before their conference tournament and maybe one more I'm not sure but uh but that was significant for them because it gets them to where they're you know they're a good seven eight spots and probably five or six points in the rankings wise in inside that NCAA tournament cut. 
beyond that, it's not, you know, as long as they're in there, that's good. It's nothing else is really going to matter. They're not going to get up and threaten a top 16. And, you know, that's just what they just need to get some good form and momentum going. But that was a very, very good win for them. Very well said. Last but not least, and the floor is yours here. I'm just going to sit back and listen. Mississippi State, 4-3 over Alabama. Chris Halioris, do what you got to do. Wow. I mean, look, these guys are like the <laughs> wow. cardiac kids now. We talk, you were calling South Carolina the 4-3 darlings. And, you know, we know my uh, my history and affinity with this team. So, I just, I don't even like, uh, it's probably like you, it's it's almost unfair that I have to cover them because it'd be like telling you to go cover the Michigan match. You know, <laughs> you're just trying to cover it and actually broadcast the match objectively. Meanwhile, inside. Easy, going, easy to do, Chris. How do you miss that? How do you miss <laughs> that? Come on, Carlos. But uh, no, they, uh, they have, the team has really come around. I will say this, the best part for them of the weekend was there have been nothing but questions about them at six all year. They've just, they've shown no ability to contribute a, a whole lot at the six spot. And they got in a hole to Alabama three, I think it was three, one before, before it went three, two from, from Sanchez at five. And it came down to Hernandez on three and freshman Ferrer uh, on six and Frere served for the match, got broken, and then all of a sudden it was five all in the second. He comes back, and a big, big one for him. He gets that one seven five, wins that match to make it three all, and send it to a full third uh, for Hernandez on three. But I think that was that for him personally, even had to be a big momentum thing that he's going to be able to carry forward because they can't they can't continue to go and just think, hey, we're probably down 1-0 considering that we're just not able to win anything at six right now. Uh, that and the fact that doubles Navansky back, it's three weeks back now. They've moved him up to the two-double spot. They were one dubs last year. Their doubles is completely different now with him in the lineup. They actually have good doubles. They're dangerous. I mean, they're still, they're still sitting there right where they belong. They're a, you know... 13 to 18, you know, challenging, trying to hunt, stay in that top 16 host spot. That's where they belong. And they're, you know, they're showing now that, you know, that's where, that's where they're probably going to be. All right. I have nothing more to add. Those are the five results. Again, you need to know just to recap them. Once again, Cornell 6-1 over Columbia, Arkansas 4-3 over Auburn, UCF 4-3 over Oklahoma State, Middle Tennessee 4-3 over Memphis and Mississippi State 4-3 over Alabama. Some weekends to rapid fire through from week number 12 of the season, Chris Halioris. And look, I try to keep things glass half full here, but we got to do our job it was a brutal weekend for Georgia in what was Manny Diaz's final weekend in Athens to just be right there in each of those matches and have South Carolina break against them for three Florida break against them for two that was tough tough weekend for the Bulldogs Chris who are still in the NCAA tournament hunt and still in their rankings wise but again that one hurt well the question is now is there going to be an addition to the schedule mm. they're 10 and 11 uh, with three matches left that they likely go two and one in. And if they do, they're 500 and all they have to do is win one match in the SEC tournament to stay 500. But that's no guarantee. I would think certainly if you want to make sure before you get to that SEC tournament that that's going to happen, that, you know, we ought to see a whoever Kennesaw state, Georgia state, Georgia Southern, somebody ought to get added into the mix in a double header. Uh, I haven't seen if that's happened, but yeah, tough, tough weekend for them. Uh, tough way for Manny to go out in his last weekend at, at home and a couple really tough, a tough weekend in particular. Um, you know, I think a lot of promise for freshman Cyrus Majub, but ends up coming, having a 5-2 lead against South Carolina, losing that match, and then being the guy that gets clinched on by Nirendorn from Florida. Just sort of a rough weekend for him to get over. Uh, but they're young, uh, yeah, yeah. and they're, they're only going to get better. That's exactly it. They're taking their lumps this year. Wait for them this year. Two seasons from now when Georgia's hosting NCAAs. That's obviously when that program wants to peak. So they got some time until then. But 
Yeah, I mean, huge wins for Florida, South Carolina. Again, my 4-3 darlings, the Gamecocks, they played another one just for us to enjoy, Chris. But tough one for Georgia, tough one for Miami. After the 4-3, uh, I think it was 4-3 or whatever it was, win over UNC, you thought maybe they could make a tournament push, but knocked off 4-1 by Georgia Tech, 4 love by Clemson, who, by the way, both very solid teams still. That one hurts for the Hurricanes. Yeah, they're yeah they're based. I mean, barring barring them coming up with you know a it's not going to be a Virginia win, but a you know a a a couple ACC tournament wins mm-hmm. over say like North Carolina, then Florida State, or something like that. They're going to need probably two of those to get them back in contention. Not to mention they're sitting at five hundred right now, so they're going to be flirting with that as well. Uh, yeah, they're they're. They're basically done. Also, news: uh, the head coach is stepping down at the end of the season. So, really? Yes that that news has broken. Uh, so so Pirich is done. End of the year. Did not see any mention of uh, uh, you know re, you know what was going to happen after that. But he is effectively he has he has resigned or stepped down as of the end of the season. By the way, this is why I love the chat. Kevin and Scotty B let us know Georgia. They added Southern Miss this Friday, Tennessee to the Nashville weekend as well. Tennessee State, excuse me, to the Nashville ah. weekend. So they're aware. Chris Hallioris. They've made their moves. <laughs> oh, there's, no, there's no doubt they're aware. <laughs> yeah, well, shout out to the chat. Again, when it's valuable messages like that, I always appreciate them. So shout out to you, uh, Kevin, Scotty B. Jonas, you've been great as well. And again, I appreciate his observations uh, throughout. Three quick weekends here. Just again, all top teams trying to consolidate top eight positions. Wake Forest, really good 4-2 win over, I'm telling you, an NC State team that is just top 16 good. I have bought in on the NC State sauce. They have weapons everywhere. Schick plays a really good match uh, against Suresh at three, and ultimately Suresh is able to clinch, I think, 6-4 in the third or 7-5, whatever it was. But they had a freshman facing off against Holden Coons. And that freshman, or I forget if it was a freshman, but it wasn't who it's normally. And that player pushes Holden Coons to a third set. They go unfinished there. Like, at Winston-Salem, that was a really impressive showing for NC State, who played around with their singles lineup a bit. Um, Maroney was down to three for Wake. He took a tough loss on that day, too. I think Staheli beat him um, as well. But again, 4-2 win. Wake Forest pulls through. Luca Powell's like 76-3. and three in his freshman season, something funky like that. Kentucky, they love to play close matches. They just do. 4-2 over Ole Miss, 4-3 over Arkansas, this team. Maybe that comes back to bite them in May, but man, is this young group going to be calloused up for that run. And then Tennessee, 4-0 win over South Carolina, 5-2 over Alabama. Good bounce back for the Vols. Chris, what do you make of all those top 10 teams staying the course, albeit though pushed here this past weekend? Yeah, I think solid from from Wake and Tennessee. The te- the Kentucky one is just sort of the thing. Now, granted, s- still, and I don't, I have not reached out to, to for you know for comment or to, to feel figure out what's going on. No Eli Stevenson mm-hmm. yet again this weekend for Kentucky. We know the freshman who's undefeated this year. Uh, they're just that much better with him in the lineup. But uh, I, it's one of those things that I think it just it. If you are already sort of on the fence, it helps your eye test go, yeah, I'm on the fence about whether they're really a, you know, five through eight type team when you're going four, two and four, three, if the Miss is in Arkansas of the SEC, but they still, they do what a, what the good teams do and they win. Yeah. Uh, and which is all you can ask is, is you got to win the match, but but yeah, I'm I would I'm a little concerned at, at the fact that that there was no Stevenson. But outside of that, they had the they have everybody else in the lineup. So uh, I I think it's just they just they're just gonna have to step up and play. Yeah, I'd also just say Monday Mitsu are putting in really good years for the Vols, and we've talked about them so much in past seasons that we haven't talked about them as much this year. But just a reminder, those two are really freaking good uh, for Tennessee. And again, mm-hmm. like talking about top two duos, you'd want I'd throw them up there with any top two and feel plenty comfortable uh rolling them out and feeling success but again wake kentucky tennessee all tuna on the weekend any final thoughts on these chris you ready to move to our final well, results i was gonna say you had rolled through unless you were gonna get there and i didn't look uh <laughs> on the other half of that wake you had talked about nc state yeah. just- by the way shout out johan it was uh fons von sambik not staheli who got the win over maroney thank you johan nice uh nc state you said you know 
they look like, and they could be a top 16. Look, oh, they got Miami. That's not going to help. But they finished the regular season. Florida State, North Carolina, Duke. Every bit of that, you know, it gives them opportunity to make the top 16. So they are in no shortage of opportunity. And then, of course, the ACC tournament. So a huh. big big finish coming for them and the chance to make the top 16. Yeah, absolutely. And with all that said, again, just to rapid fire through some results we've seen uh, elsewhere, just your final thoughts on everything uh, from what was, again, a really fun week number 12 in the college tennis world. Let's start, Chris Hallior's just some teams that went undefeated on the weekend. Duke, UNC sweeping the Notre Dame-Louisville pairings. I thought UNC had their best weekend of the season. I know they should beat Louisville and Notre Dame, but both were 4-0 and both were comprehensive. Fresh from Patrick Shun starting to look like we expected him to look. He was dominant uh, in the middle of their singles lineup this past weekend. Texas, Baylor, 2-0 weekends. I think any team that makes the trip to BYU, that match is always just going to be a little trickier than you expect. Elevation, if you're outdoors, those mountains in the background, I would certainly be distracted. Princeton over Penn, 4-2. That was a big one. San Diego, 4-1 over Pepperdine. So it looks like they're going to take the conference Liberty over USF, 4-2. I know you saw that one. Kennesaw State, the big upset, 4-3 over Stetson. Shout out to them. Uh, North Florida knocking off Stetson this week as well. Tough week for Stetson. Um, Shout out to my Tulsa team, 4-0 over Wichita State. That's really all I got, the highlights from everything else on the weekend. Did we miss anything, Chris? You know, I'm going to call one team out because we really haven't given them, I'm going to say, any love this year. And I think they were in your list of results. How about Denver, Ruskin? Mm. Denver, 17 and 0. Really? <laughs> they have not. Hold on. Hold on. This is why I have the laptop out. Let me confirm this. <laughs> they are 17 and 0. Are they they're our last undefeated team? 17 and 0. All right. Who's the resume? At Purdue, Utah, UTSA, Boise State. Air from Oregon. Sorry, you hear me go. Eh, sorry, I didn't mean that. I really respect what you're doing uh, over at Denver. Yeah, I mean, 17 and 0 is 17 and 0. Again, that's about all you could ask for. And again, that's a testament. Yeah. To, to, what don't I know about this team? What should I be knowing about this Drew Eberle led squad? I, I mean, look, they. It, I think always, I, I they've always had, or for many years, played some good doubles. Uh, it's a they're they're just solid and uh, you know they're going to they're they're not going to go out there and knock off the top 20 type teams but look these guys they're solid they're probably not going to you know I don't think we're going to necessarily see them get a chance to play uh any any of those teams anyway the Boise States of the world probably the best on their on their schedule you know Drake historically has been decent they've got them left but Drake and Omaha is the best they got left on the schedule. They have a good chance of running the table into their conference tournament. And look, yeah, they could very well be undefeated. And they've always been one of those teams that are either winning the conference or they're right there on the bubble. And this this year is no exception. We're talking about them every week moving forward. We have an undefeated team, and it's April 3rd. 17-0 Denver, and you're right. They have the inside path to finish the regular season conference play undefeated. They're going to go to Arizona. They're going to be the number three seed in that region, Chris. They're going to face Oklahoma State in round one. And that's going to be a really fun match. I'm just saying. I'm just me doing some forecasting right now. That's the vibes I feel in the college tennis gods there. But shout out to you for shouting them out. I appreciate that. That said, that's your look at week number 12. And with the ending of the number re comes the unveiling of another set of rankings, both from the ITA as well as us here at Crack Rackets. We'll start Chris Hallior's with the current ITA top 10 and how ours differs right now. A lot of similarities. In fact, we have the same top 10 schools, albeit in a slightly different order, as the computer rankings. We agree with Columbia at 10. We didn't knock Arizona as hard for the Stanford loss. We keep them at 7. The ITA rankings have them at 9. We both have A&M at 8, although it's worth noting both of us submitted these rankings before that Oklahoma result was final. Uh, number 7 for them is Tennessee. There are number 9. Number 6, Wake Forest. There are 5. Five is Texas in the computer rankings. There are current number three. Kentucky 
No national indoors. They're up to number four, Chris. Is that the highest ranked a team who didn't play the national indoors has ever been? Some scholars are arguing maybe. We'll get the IT team on that, get you an update for next week. TCU, three in the computer rankings. There are four. Texas is our three, by the way. Virginia, Ohio State, two and one. I should say Ohio State, one, Virginia, two. We see the same in our Cracked Rackets rankings. It's hard to see much dispute, Chris. We have the same 10 teams uh, in this discussion. Again, the real fun starts after Arizona at 7. I think it's very clear those top 7, Ohio State, Virginia, Texas, TCU, Wake Forest, Kentucky, Arizona, put them in whatever order you want, um, but that's your top 7 right now, and we're fighting for that 8th spot. And yeah, like A&M, Tennessee, Columbia, Obviously, Oklahoma now. San Diego still deserves just a, a whiff of that conversation. And maybe now you throw 12-4 and 4 Stanford back into the mix. Like this, it, it, it's an int- – I, I like this top 10 group. I really enjoy the intrigue surrounding this. Yeah, I well, direct, you always ask directionally <laughs> correct. Yeah, we've, we've got the same teams. They're all very close, you know, a spot or two here or there. No, I, I have no problems with it. I think the the intrigue to me, really, I sort of sit at, I think I'm good with right now the top six, and I throw Arizona up in that spot still. The intrigue to me comes with the trio of SEC teams mm-hmm. in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas A&M in, you know, what sort of order do you put them in and how much credence do you lend to the possibility of one of them actually making a big run? And and I think that's that's going to be the intriguing part for me is what what happens there. I just think that that logjam of SEC teams, you know, how many of them get top eight? Do two? Of, it's it certainly feels like two of them are probably going to end up top eight, but you know. It, it would take Columbia getting back in the mix or somebody to make just a huge jump to 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 make that not happen. Uh, and I don't think Arizona is going to get knocked out, but who knows? We'll we'll see. I just I just don't know what to make of the the order and and how those teams should you know should be listed. Well, if the Ivy League's knocked out, another spot opens. I think we assumed one of Columbia, Harvard, whomever it may be, was going to take that spot. That feels a little bit less likely now. So I agree with you. Like, is it a second SEC team? Is it if it's not a second SEC team, who the heck is you, it going to be? Well, the thing I haven't done the math on, I don't think it's possible. I haven't looked, but you you know my my head instantly goes to. Well, what if Stanford does what they did That's this week? Fascinating. All the way out. Do they actually have a possibility to to get up there? They're, they're no, because they're, they're going to be the one seed. If they were the three seed or two seed at the Pac-12, you'd say maybe, right? But does another? They just, need, they just need help from teams to beat. And the problem is, okay, so they beat. They get two wins. They, obviously, they got to beat Arizona again to make those points count. And then. What's the next best win they could get? Probably Arizona State, right? I think that's better than UCLA at this point. Are those two gonna, you know, gonna get them from 18 and in fact 18, but they're already down to 21 in the live rankings just because we went to nine wins next week now and and they just have their last two are basically you know nothing. So so they're just short on wins. I don't think there's enough, but yeah, I I don't think anybody else honestly has much of a chance to really make that. I look and go, who's going to make the huge push to get themselves all the way up into that top eight. If a Columbia, if Columbia say, I, do they have Harvard left still? I believe so. Yes. They still have the regular season matchup. Yeah. So if they beat a Harvard, does that get them there without a conference tournament? I don't even know if it does. I don't think it probably does. San Diego doesn't have enough left on the boat and everybody else is like 10 points behind. So it sort of feels like, you know, the race is maybe Columbia getting in there with a win over Harvard. Not sure they if they can get in the mix. Other than that, it's those top nine schools mm-hmm. battling for eight spots. And maybe kind of- Oklahoma, if they did get a win over Texas or made another final of the Big 12 tournament, right? Like they do have enough points on the board. Yeah. Oh, Oklahoma. Absolutely. Yeah. They're like they're ninth right now. So that's yeah, that's a good call out They're yeah. They're up to nine right now in the live rankings. They absolutely are in the mix for for top eight now. Yeah, they would be the last team I'd mention. And that's like, that A&M win is huge just from the head to head perspective, because should they end up like eight, nine, that's one of the 
criteria that gets considered for the NCAA swapping them, you know, even if they end up ninth to potentially get the eight seed. Can we make a pact that if Denver finishes X and one on the season, like whatever it is, X and one, and their loss is to the host school at their region, we're putting them nine in our year end rankings. Like that's just happening <laughs> because if they're X and one, like, and their one loss, ideally, like I'm praying their one loss is to like a top five team where it's like, well, look, they played a top five team. That's the only team that managed to beat them. I'm putting them at nine moving forward. I should have realized they were 17 and 0 overall. I'm, I'm blaming myself. That's all I've been thinking about since you've said it, Chris. Um, but no, I also agree completely with your rankings analysis. Again, that race for those final top eight spots. So fascinating. Other teams, by the way, that received consideration in our poll this week, again, uh, San Diego, Oklahoma, Harvard, Michigan State, Duke, Stanford got a top 10 vote. Uh, Shout out to John J. Parsons, bold, uh, and Mississippi State also receiving votes. That's everything from week number 12, Chris Hallior. So now let's turn our attention towards week number 13 of this 2024 college tennis season. There are some fun ones on the schedule. Let's just go straight predictions from you because we still got one more segment to get to. Baylor, Texas at Oklahoma does Oklahoma go 2 and 0? No. They, they go 1 and 1. They lose to Texas, they beat Baylor? Yes. All right. What about Wake Forest NC State at Florida State? This is truly the Knolls' last chance to make a top 16 push. They got the Virginia match at home, they got Duke and UNC at home. They went 0 and 3 in all three of those occasions. Can they find a way to get one of these this weekend? Yeah, they're in a great I mean, they're in a great spot right now. Uh, I think the the wake match is going to be tough. They they've got to go at least one and one, and I don't even know how to call them. So I'll say that I'll say that they just go one and one and keep themselves in top sixteen contention. But uh, yeah, this is the monster weekend for ACC to show. Hey, I'm the guy. I can carry my team. We're at home. We're going two and zero, oh, and that would be huge for them to do it. Yeah, absolutely. UNC at Duke, two fascinating teams. Yeah, UNC seems to be playing better of late, but you got to take Duke at the at home. Princeton at Columbia, the best match. I'm devastated we're not broadcasting. After what happened with Cornell, you're like, wow, man, can Princeton do it? I'm still gonna say no, that's gotta that's gotta put Columbia even more. Or I'm sorry, ah. Columbia. No, you're looking it up. No, yeah, no, I I just don't think Princeton can do it. <sighs> I want I want to call it so so bad. Come on, I, just don't. I Come can't do it at that new Columbia tennis facility. I know they've already lost a match there, but I'm never picking against Columbia because that place is freaking heaven. And coming off of a loss, they're going to be ready for In this. In the Philippines, one. isn't it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're. you're dude, no comment. Um, Arizona State. No, you know what My I do have a favorite I'll video of yours from indoors weekend. I'll say it again. Um. You walk onto that Columbia facility, you look out the window, you see out the river, the Hudson or whatever it is, and you're like, yeah, we should have fought a revolution to make this land ours. There's absolutely no reason we should be paying taxes to some foreign entity. You're like, this is our land, and if we do it. I'm still like all of all of those things, all of those, you know, videos you did from indoor weekend. I will. Well, I'm going to be like 20 years. We're still going to be doing this. And, and I'm going to be going. Remember, remember Enzo Aguiar playing the microphone game going. What is Pikachu doing in the Philippines? Philippines? Like <laughs> that, that will that will never leave my head. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Oh, I wish there's some other things. I don't know what did or didn't make the cut. I don't remember. We might still have bloopers. I hope we get all of Andrew Rube's session for Harvard because when I say coach nailed it, like, again, I think I've already given this out. I think I've already said this, but I'm going to say it again. Um, There was one that I planted because it was the end of the day. It had been a long day. I was like, I'm having some fun with this Harvard crew. They were very willing to have fun. So I was like, okay, I can go for it. So I had Sonam mouth to, to Andrew Howard Endelman is a better coach than than you or me or whatever. And so so Andrew's sounding it out. He goes, Howard is a better – and then he stops and he goes, I'm not saying that. And literally the whole <laughs> team goes, ah! Like it was just this moment of victory. And I was just like, God, 
I love this sport. Like, that's the stupid thing I miss most about covering the action, not being in the thick of the action. Because if your coach gives that as your response, you're like, coach, we will battle for you. We will beat Columbia in the round of 16. And lo and behold, that is precisely what they did. So do they have to thank me for that win? Some scholars would argue maybe. Uh, Chris Halliors. Last but not least, I want a prediction from you. Arizona State at Arizona. Oh, you got to take the Wildcats here. Uh, I mean, again, Arizona State, super, super dangerous. But uh, at home for Arizona, you, you got to ride with them. Yeah, again, fascinating week. Again, some other good ones. Columbia at Penn, Cornell at Princeton, Liberty at VCU, Yale at Harvard, Indiana, who's had a sneaky good season. They're making their Michigan trip. Illinois Northwestern, must-win matches at Nebraska for all three teams Kentucky at South Carolina. It's going to be a really fun week number 13, folks. So, of course, follow our coverage Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Big 12 coverage on ESPN+. Plus. Friday, Sunday, ACC, SEC on ESPN+. Plus. Of course, Big 10 Sunday on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel as well. Chris Halioris, that's our look at week number 13. Any final thoughts before I give you one last thought before we go? I, I'll get to your last one. I was going to say that la- one of those last matches you called out, that VCU Liberty match, Huge bubble implications there. VCU sitting at 39, Liberty at 45 right now. So that that match, big, big implications for the tournament bubble. You know, anytime I see Liberty on the schedule and they're playing a ranked opponent, I put it on the tier two because I'm like, Chris is going to bring it up anyways. So just like, <laughs> come on. I know I know my people. At this point, we've been doing this show for six years together. Wait, I wait but like, like there's half your people there now. Like the C-Leagues are your adopted family. I so- love, I, look. <laughs> we're live so i can't say it uh, but you know what i'm thinking there's only yeah one i know what you're thinking he be- may not be your adopted family yeah. but kyle is oh, yeah exactly <laughs> i don't know who's rising everywhere but kyle seelig has always been rising in my mind and so you know again i guess that's my thought uh, yeah he's, I, I may not be on the team but i'm on the team okay yeah. uh, that's well said anyways folks i'm jewish that's the joke um, all right, I feel like we can say it at this point. Anyways, that's your look ahead at all things happening uh, here this season. But last but not least, Chris Helioris, before we go, one last thing I want to throw at you. And again, it's because we are a month out from this 2024 NCAA tournament. And it's just worth of taking stock how the storylines, the uncertainty surrounding the field feels relative to where we've been in other years entering the NCAA tournament. So I wanted to play a little comparison game. Just a reminder, what have we seen this decade? 21, 22, 23. How does it compare to the field at with 24? I think this field is pretty similar to last year where going into the NCAA quarterfinals, you really could have made a case for all eight teams like Virginia, Kentucky, Michigan, TCU, Ohio State, Georgia, uh, Texas, and maybe you wouldn't have made the case for South Carolina coming out of their Tennessee match, but certainly the other seven teams what we had seen from them all season long, they had been flirting with that sort of status all season long as well. And, you know, once we got to the NCAA tournaments, it was roll the balls out, who could handle the conditions best. Obviously, the answer was Virginia, but it did feel like, and no disrespect to last year's South Carolina team, but seven of those teams, had any of them walked away with the NCAA tournament, Chris, we wouldn't have been jaw dropped, right? We would have understood where all the runs came from why those teams had the successes that they did 2022 was a little bit different it did feel like going into 2022 and by the way shout out to scotty b who pointed out lowest ranked team or highest ranked team to not make national indoors 2021 florida who finished the year ranked number one but it was only an eight team field at the national indoors so that doesn't count scotty b uh still 2022 was fascinating because it did feel like That Florida-Virginia quarterfinal match. Go check the tape. I said it on the podcast. We both thought, Chris Hallios, whoever won that match was winning the NCAA tournament. And obviously, when Virginia knocked off Florida, it was a very strong sign of what that team would be doing moving forward. Now, again, going into the semis, things had moved indoors. Ohio State did have 4-0 wins over Tennessee, Kentucky, and Ohio State. uh, And Virginia, the three other teams remaining. But... I think we learned very firmly from that tournament that Virginia was who they have obviously grown into. Still, that one felt a little bit more, op- uh, you know, top contender than kind of everyone else. 2021 was a little different because it was the COVID-related year because you had this young Virginia team that didn't lose in conference play but was still so young and untested. You had 
this USC team with Kukerman and Riley Smith and that National Indoor 2020 institutional know-how, Blumberg and Hijikata, Seguin, the 2021 National Indoor champions, obviously a Baylor team with Broom, Stokowiak, and Furman as their bottom three of their lineup, obviously Boitan La Soto. Again, lineups you remember. If I was to compare this season to any of those three past, I actually think I'd go with 2021 is what this year reminds me of most. In that 2021 season, you kind of knew, okay, Florida was your Texas in the sense that they weren't there at the national indoors, but look at the lineup one through six. You just can't deny the talent that was there. Ohio State is probably your, they're not your UNC because I don't think that's, they're your Baylor, excuse me, and just like, you know the faces, you know what these guys are capable of. We already saw them have a success this season, obviously the difference being the national indoor title versus finals. Um, You know, again, who else were your contenders going into that one? Who's your plucky Virginia team? I don't know if we have that this year, but you know, we have the Virginia's maybe your Florida or or any any way you want to spin it. That's the one I think of this most of, Chris, where there is like more firm of an inner circle, but the gap between those teams and the rising Tennessee team from that 2021 season, A&M with Vachero, Aguilar, Habib, obviously that team played Florida really close. Illinois that year who lost to Florida in the round of 16, that was a ridiculous ridiculously good team that if they didn't play Florida round of 16 probably ends up in the quarters or semis. I think that's the the closest comparison for this year. So I'm starting to feel a little 2021-y, Chris. Is that fair? Yeah, I don't know. I've, uh, yeah, but I, I feel like, you know, I still feel like this year we've got four teams. I, I mean, I, I still feel that in my gut is there's four teams. Okay. And anybody outside of those four to kind of crack in, it's going to be tough. I think last year we had more than four. Yeah, uh, so seven. Yeah, we were seven, yeah. and USC was seven and a half because if they beat Michigan, they would have also been seven. So I wouldn't, yeah, I would say, yeah, definitely not. I I think, it. yeah, 21 is probably, is definitely probably the the closest uh, to, to having that. Like, it's just a solid four teams. Um, I just don't know that, you know, the, the only difference is, I don't know. I felt really, really good about it was just going to be Florida that year. Uh, and right. And I don't Outdoors know. Outdoors in Orlando. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Kessler lighting up the pregame <laughs> tailgate. I mean, let's. But I I don't know that I have that strong a conviction about. Yeah. Somebody is the team. Like I literally think of the four. Uh, wide open but, between them. But you liked Florida a lot better in 2021 than I did. Like, I was... Yeah, like, I said, it's it's, it's you, always tough. We had this conversation. It's tough yeah. in hindsight looking back at it to what did we think beforehand. Well, but again, like... Because, yeah, you and Maddie both picked Baylor. Well, I think... I I'm surprised Baylor. I didn't pick UNC. Like, knowing me and my Blumberg, how I remember thinking about the Blumberg era, just like, again, <laughs> I've never... I've said this before. I'll say it again. I've never been more devastated then because I called Tennessee Arizona that which was the match on the other side of UNC Georgia and I didn't even follow the other score line because back then I thought I needed to focus really hard Chris uh boy was I young and naive um and I walked out and I go oh like so Tennessee's playing UNC next round and everyone's like no like and I said like, what do you mean no and they go you didn't see like they lost 4-3. They lost three straight. I was like, no. I was like, you're lying to me. I was like, that just cannot be true. Um, and it was very much true. And I was just so sad I didn't get to watch any of that match or follow along with the emotions of it. Like, again, there were a lot of good I, – I, I thought there was more of an inner circle that year, but there were a lot of really good teams. 22 – like, I just don't think we have a Florida relative to the rest of the field. Like, Ohio State, Texas, TCU – and Virginia, if all healthy, you'd feel about all of them the way you felt about 2022 Florida uh, entering. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. We've just yeah. got more than just that. It's a, it's yeah, a big that's group. Pro- but, but but it's not seven wide. Like, it's no, not no, last year where not. it was like, I don't even know. So 2021 is yeah. probably the closest comparison. Let me ask you this. Which of these four, if you were to rank them, and I know we haven't seen this one yet. So actually rank the previous three, 21, 22, 23. Rank them by favorite. But favorite meaning what? What would you enjoy most? How they all played out? Not or like the 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 vibes surrounding it all. Um, 
Well, I, I mean, I think the, the, the 21 was that being in Orlando and, and obviously Florida being there and the big crowd that, that was phenomenal. I, so I, that would be my, my favorite. I think number two would be last year because the repeat for Virginia and those guys coming back and just sort of being the, yeah, we didn't, we may not have been here all year, but we're, you know, you know who we are and we show up in May kind of thing. I think, I think them being able to do that was more exciting than the first one uh, for them. And so then I would say I, I would go the, the Florida year, the second Virginia, and then the first Virginia. Yeah, you're just wrong. Um, 2021 was the best <laughs> final for sure. Like that hands down the atmosphere. Baylor taking the doubles point in that final was the wrinkle again that just kind of needed to happen to keep that as a match. And that was the best final, but there's no doubt like, I'll write a book about the 2023 NCAA championships one day and how it should have played out because like it was, it should have been even better than it was. Like, you know, I'm the first to say that Like we got robbed by the sun and humidity and all these different things, but like every quarterfinal, every matchup was must see because it was just like, I don't know. I, I don't know. Texas has been number one all year long, but TC won national indoors, but Virginia did another Virginia thing in the ACC. Like, Michigan and Ohio State have both been really good all year long. And just, like, again, Kentucky is this – they just won the SEC tournament. It just feels like they're riding this wave of momentum, and they made the finals in 2022. They've got this momentum as well. Last year's was the best because uh, the more contenders, the merrier. 21 is certainly the second best because every Florida night match was – sorry, was the fucking amazing. Like, ugh. Illinois, so good. AM, so good. Um, I don't remember who the semifinal was. I apologize. I'm blanking on that because I Baylor, Tennessee, like almost killed me as a semifinal. It was so good between those two teams. Didn't we have I'm we blanking. Tennessee, it wasn't Tennessee, UNC. USC, maybe. No, no, no. It wasn't USC. It was, was USC. It was South Carolina who beat uh, uh who beat uh no no no, it was Texas. It was Texas. It was Texas, sorry. Uh Texas beat South Carolina, right? Um, in that, no, 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 Texas beat South Carolina and then Texas beat USC, right? Yeah. To make that semifinal. Cleve playing those late night matches back when, again, all those, again, yes, that's the memory. But that was a different kind. Again, that was a young rising freshman Texas team. Even then, that was still fun. Just them under the lights. That final was so good. The women's final that year was so good. I mean, the Pepperdine run was just breathtaking. Every match that they played, you were on the edge of your seat. That's still number two for me. And then as much as I love Champagne, 2022 has to be number three because that was just weird. Like, it just got weird. I don't know. Like, all the matches. And then Virginia just, they caught lightning in a bottle. And it was just, like, so fascinating to watch. But, yeah, their win in 23 was the more enjoyable one to watch, I think. I'd go 23, 21, 22. Yeah, well, at least we both agree. Twenty two is third. Third, <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> and I mean, I just, I thought you, I figured you'd go the route of like, I mean, I, I guess you could go either way on twenty three because I know how how much you love to talk about, you know, yeah. the sun and everything else <laughs> that impacted it now, and how we got robbed of great tennis, but at the same time, we we got the pleasure of great, you know, storylines and. and and a very interesting matches because of it. So, yeah, that, you know, you could go either way with that. One. Two sneaky favorite finals since I know you asked, and I'm glad to talk about it. Not matches, but just like final few rounds. 2012 NCAAs, UCLA versus USC, Virginia versus Pepperdine. Both matches forced to move indoors due to weather. Both of them played late into the night. That was a special weekend. 2014, Oklahoma making the final. The, the Giron, McDonald, uh, Clay Thompson, healthy Gage Brimer, Carousel, Adrian Puget team losing in the semis, which to this day we could do a five for five on. Like those are some of my sneaky favorites. <sighs> Daniel Wynn diving volley versus Mitchell Frank foot tap are the two best matches of all time. Like you just have to, it depends which one is your shade of preference. But yeah, that's your history lesson for today's Great Shot Podcast. That's where we will wrap today's show. Again, a shout out to you as always, Chris Helioris, who not only joins me every week, not only codes with West Stuff every night, but then steers the ship on Fridays and Sundays for our SEC coverage on ESPN. Plus, any final things you'd like to discuss before we wrap today's show? 
No, ready. I'm I'm ready for another week of SEC broadcasting. You know, this that's been the the best part this year is yeah. getting to do that every single week. It's been a blast. You're done with podcasting. You're ready to be the full time broadcaster. Yeah. I can tell. It's the thrill. It's that there's nine things happening at once, and there's just no rush quite like it. Well, the problem is, you know, if that's all I did, Gruskin. I just wouldn't get to see you that much. So. <laughs> Which is a win and a loss. Like, again, it, it's 50-50. So I, I got to have this. Yeah, yeah no. Th- there's nothing better than when I walk out and I'm going to the kitchen and I hear a voice. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's Chris. And I'm like, but I'm not talking to him. Uh, and it's just <laughs> you and West stuff. And I'm like, dude, it's like 2.30. Like, what are you guys doing? And he's like, oh, we yeah. just – Chris had this idea. So we're just checking on the software. You know, nothing too yeah. big. But with all that said, shout out to you. Shout out to West stuff as always, without whom none of this is possible. With that. That said, for our fantastic super producer, Daniel Westoff, our fantastic co-host, Chris Hallioris, and all of us here at both Crack Rackets and the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. Chris, what do we tell our listeners? Hey, great shot. And we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.